I'm Doyle Williams, the Dean of the Sam M. Walton College of Business. It's my pleasure to introduce today's special WCOB presentation of Meet the Leaders. We're honored to have as our distinguished guest today, Mr. Jamie Diamond, Chairman and CEO of Bank One, the nation's sixth largest bank. Mr. Diamond has engineered an amazing turnaround for Bank One since being tapped as the bank's chairman and CEO. Mr. Diamond will be questioned by three members of the Walton College Dean Student Advisory Board. These students are first, Sarah Barnett, Senior Marketing Major from Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Miguel Fuentes, MBA student from Mexico City, Mexico, and Jeremy Lloyd, Junior Accounting Major from El Dorado, Arkansas. Let's begin with the first question for today's forum from Sarah. Mr. Diamond, I was just wondering if this was your first trip to Arkansas or if you've been here before. This is my first trip to Arkansas, but I'm really happy to be here. Well, on behalf of the students of the U of A and the Walton College of Business, we want to welcome you today. Thank and you. Um, I'd like to know, right after you graduated from, with your undergraduate degree, what, did, what was your next step? Did you, what was your first job? What did you do? I was a deferred admit at Harvard Business School, which means I had to work for two years before I went. Mm -hmm. So I worked at a small consulting company in Boston that you wouldn't have heard of. That wasn't a particularly good one for two years, and then I went to uh, business school. I actually think working before business school was actually a pretty good thing. It, then business school is something I did for myself, and I knew how, why I was going. Okay, thank you. So you would recommend working? I think working prior before to graduate to school graduate kind school. of makes you think twice about what you want to accomplish in life and why you want to go. And um, I think it meant more to me as I read the cases because I kind of have been a little bit, I had some experience about what they were talking about. So. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think a lot of seniors are wondering that right now with looking into going on to right. grad school or, or working first. Thank you. Miguel? I'm going to give a little bit jump, is Mr. Diamond, knowing the difficult situation of Bank One, what, what was your motivation to, to get that job? Well, I hadn't been working for a year or so, and I looked at multiple jobs in multiple industries, including a lot of these internet companies, and um, what I realized was what I know, what I'm good at, what I practiced, was financial services, and I like big companies and complex situations and lots of people. And when this job came to my attention, I realized it's probably one of the few CEO jobs of a major financial company which will be offered to someone outside the company. And it's probably my big opportunity. If I wasn't going to do that, I probably should think about something else. And the hardest part was I had to move my family, which I'd never done before. Right. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy? Mr. Diamond, we all know CEOs have to make tough decisions all the time. Could you tell me the hardest decision that you had to make and what made that decision so hard? You know, the hardest decisions, honestly, are when you have to ask someone to leave the company. And it's hard because you usually can't sleep the night before, and you, you, you have to do some of these things, but it hurts people. It hurts you. It hurts them. It hurts their families. And, and you know, a lot of people who work for them may think differently about the decision you're making. And um, so I tend, and you want to do it right. Those decisions I'd rather do a little bit late, but really think carefully about it, but uh, not avoid making them. How would you advise about going about <coughs> Uh, when you have to make that decision and communicate it to the to the employee, what's the approach did you yeah. take? I uh, first of all, I usually did all that. I try to do it all at once, like um, meaning I woke up in the morning, I came in and did it first thing. I always, uh, I think, when you're asking someone to leave a company, very often it's not because they're bad, and you want to be very careful about that. But there are a lot of other series of reasons, and you kind of try to put a nicer light on it, but. That um, you know that you need your own team, or you got you need people doing it slightly differently, or there's not a cultural mix, or or uh, it's you know time for them to try something different. Um, usually, I give them time to talk and talk back. I don't spend a lot of time arguing with them. I think that is not a good thing to do. I also always have it set up to have someone talk to them afterwards, either from HR or someone who's a senior executive who's a good, good friend of theirs, so that th once they leave, I usually walk them down there and say, look, I've spoken to so and so about know his job and I think it'd be good for you to spend a little time with him. Okay. Sarah? Well I would like to know in your opinion what makes a company valuable? Uh, what makes a company valuable? You know companies are kind of like living and breathing orga or organisms and I think what really makes you valuable is it going to surprise you it's not their profits because profits are a measure of something in a very short period of time. It's what I would call would be more like their infrastructure. Their systems, people, culture, ethics, the ability to innovate, change, challenge, promote, recruit, train. Because if you do that, an organization can continue to grow. Any institution. 
And if you don't, they, they fail. And so it, those, that's why I look at it as being more important. It's kind of the other side of the, you know, the balanced scorecard. There's also, you know, if you don't survive financially, you're dead. So I always look at that. That to me is a sine qua non. So how are you trying to increase the value in bank one through the infrastructure? And well, you know, you, we all inherit different problems. But when I got there, we, our costs were too high. Mm -hmm. Our service was bad. Our, we had multiple data systems. We had a, a poor culture in a lot of parts of the company. Not all of it. Some of the people were fabulous and outstanding. Um, and what you want to do is let those people shine and remove the ones who aren't adding any value to the company. And uh, So I focus a lot on what I call the infrastructure and getting that stuff done relentlessly every day, every meeting, every system. And once you're doing that, and out in the field all the time, because a lot of it, you know, nurturing the field and understanding the problems, making long list of problems and then just knocking them off the list all the time. And, uh, uh, and I, I know that, that that including we put financial discipline in place, clean up the balance sheet, cut the dividends, cut our expenses a billion and a half dollars. So we put the company in a sound financial footing as we built these more, more infrastructure related things. Uh, yeah. Danny, in the current economy, how do you could keep the balance between short-term results and long-term results to build the organizations? Yeah, that's a great question. I always focus on the right long-term results and that I don't ever really want to make a decision that I say, well, it's wrong for long-term, but we need the, you know, need the profit in the short-term. Every now and then, that does come up, that the cost is too much or something like that. And in some of those investments, you, you kind of layer them in, but very deliberately. Right? So when you do your budget and planning, you really know that you can be spending this kind of money in certain I issues with marketing or systems or conversions. So you can plan those kind of investments that are very large and expensive. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy? And how, did you, how did you use your previous job experience with City Group to assist you in working for Bank One? Well, you know, I was uh, very fortunate to have the experience I had at City Group. I had, you know, City Group, I had been at commercial credit in the CFO there and the president of Travers and the president of the city. And all that time, we bought a lot of companies, sold a lot of companies, fixed a lot of problems. I learned from not just Sandy Weil, my, my boss, but from a lot of fabulous management there, how they did things, how they got it done. We saw a lot of mistakes. We made our own mistakes. And I think it's a lot like, almost like any other thing you do, you actually do get better at it. You've just been there before, contract people, systems, services. And uh, so I think I've learned from all of that. And that company did well. I think the fact that you had a company that does well over a long period of time probably gives you much more opportunity than a company that's done nothing for a long period of time. Okay. All right. Sarah? Mr. Donovan, how often do you evaluate yourself and like look at your own strengths and weaknesses? And what are some of your strengths as a leader and your yeah. weaknesses? Uh, I don't you know. CEOs are not well known for being introspective. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I do actually, when I, I evaluated myself on the board this year, and I went, I, gave, I had an, a, an objective sheet, mm -hmm. and I put it up, and I told them A, B, C, and I went through all the things I thought I did well and not, and then the things which we did evaluate happened that year, that how do I handle those things, and um, I think it's very important to do, and I do it periodically. I very often do it with people very close to me, mm -hmm. who I sit down with and we talk about what's going, what's working, and they, you know, the people are very clear, they tell me, you, Jamie, you sh never should have done that. That was a setback. So I think it's kind of a constant process of doing that. And, uh, and I, you know, it's hard to talk about your own strengths and weaknesses because you don't have a clear picture of yourself as mm -hmm. other people might have. And I do work hard and I care a lot. So um, hopefully that matters. Okay. okay, excellent. How do you share those beliefs with your people? What I mean is in a really big corporation like Bank One, how do you transfer those beliefs, those values to hold the people until the front line employee? That he's working well, in your. The first thing is the top, you know, the top 20 people, 15 are probably new. Some from inside the company, some from outside. So it's not just me anymore. It's a lot of people. We have s common values, common things, and a lot of people are doing it separately down below. But wherever I go, we have town hall meetings. Uh, other people have town hall meetings. Anyone can walk up to my office, send me an email, get a send me call, call me. I'll call them back. So you know, other managers learn. Well, Jamie's calling them back. Maybe I should learn to respond to their problems first. So it, it's relentless. I mean, every call, every person, every branch I walk into, every town hall meeting, uh, every business meeting, every support meeting, and with, you know, you turn up the heat. As you get better, you get better quicker. It's just kind of got ex exponential. So, but it's not me anymore. It's a lot of people making the changes and fixing it and changing the culture a little bit. And building on that point, how do you speed the decision making process in, in Bank One? I mean, how would you empower the people to take decisions? You know, the first part is at every meeting make a follow-up list that's specific, actionable, and who's going to do it when. 
and we really didn't do it. It was just an absolute lack of discipline. So everyone knows now, you make a list, follow up, and when. And I ask all the people, have you spoken your mind? Is, you know, don't come and see me after and say you should have said this, but you don't want to embarrass people. On the list, on the table right now. If we can't get to it, we put it to the side. But we actively decide that. And if, you know, a lot of people who didn't make good lists or you know, afterwards the dog ate my homework kind of stuff, well, eventually you root those people out. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy. And now, seeing as though you turned Bank One around, how, what plans do you have in place to help Bank One to continue and grow in the banking field? Yeah, I mean, you know, Bank One, I think we've done a lot to get it to be an okay to good company, but I, don't, I would not consider ourselves a, an exceptional company yet. And I would really like to be a very good company that people are really proud of it. And to do, and then what you really need to see is you want to see us be innovative, have organic growth, new stores, new products, new ideas, and do some acquisition. And you know, we, we can do all of those. We've got to earn the right to do the acquisition. We have to demonstrate to our own, to ourselves, our employees, and our shows, hey, these folks, when they find a problem, they get it and they fix it, and that's no different than an acquisition. You have to manage complex things and get them done. What would be some of the criteria for such acquisitions? At what point in the company and then the nature of those? Uh, yeah. The point targets. of the company um, that we have a management team that can act with haste, non-politically, and I know that if we, the day we do it, that from HR to Treasury to systems to marketing to sales, people go in, and they don't just go in and shoot it apart. They also encompass the other teams, the other cultures, bring them in, form proper management teams, everyone's doing their job. And we're proving that to ourselves by running our business well and by doing these big conversions. These conversions we're doing are almost the same thing, changing how we run stuff, getting the stuff converted. It takes military discipline to do it. So it's all of that, our own financial disciplines, the capital wherewithal, which we now do have. So we're kind of ready, but I think most, if you ask my management team, they say, wait until we get this last conversion done, which is late this year. Okay, very good. Who's next? Okay. Sarah? How do you balance your personal life with your career? Since you're so successful and a CEO, how do you balance that? Yeah, you know, I, um, I think that you, set, and first of all, I think having kids is more of a demand than having a job, to tell the truth. And, um, and I, you really have to stop doing things that aren't on the list that are really important. I mean, family's important, and I have to have the job do well, and obviously my country, but, um, so, you know, I don't watch a lot of TV, and I don't watch a lot of sports, and if my friends come in from out of town, I'll go to dinner with them, and I go, when I'm in town and I'm free, I go home for dinner, and, you know, I, I very often I land at 12 at night or leave at 5 in the morning so that I'm home, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to, uh, so, uh, and my, I've never taken vacation without the kids. My wife and I have always taken our kids with the kids. That may have been a mistake. If you get if you're married, I tell you, take a little vacation without it. But um, you, just, you just try to be really careful about your time. Mm -hmm. And I believe you have to. I don't believe that quality time makes up for quantity time with children. I, don't, I think if you don't have enough quantity, you will not know them. There will be no quality whatsoever. So, um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Yeah? Which are the three most important values in the life of Jane? Jamie Dimon, yeah. your principles. Yeah, I'm just, just going to go back to answer this. I'm going to answer that second. It's kind of related. Like, one of the things my girls and I do, we take RV trips, which everyone gets mm -hmm. really surprised about because we're just behind together for five right. days in the road and stuff like that. And so there are little ways that you always are deeply okay. involved in your kids' lives and uh, stuff like that. The most important values in my life, well, I, you know, I put it this way family first, country second, company third. And I think I would tell people that in the company too, because I want, if you were working, I'd say, you've got to, I know, I know you've got family demands. Your wife, your kids, your parents, your, they're more important than the company. And, uh, uh, and I think if, you know, particularly in something like 9-11, the country I know is more important than our company. And therefore, you change what you're doing because of things like that. And so that's how I, I kind of keep it very simplistic and such. And uh, other than that, I'd give you a different set of values. I'd put kind of just, uh, uh, character as being almost the highest one on an individual basis. And character means to me that people don't shave the truth. You can rely on them. And uh, it's probably become the most important thing, in my opinion, how I judge most people. Someone one time said character is what you do when no one is looking. Right. Is, mm -hmm. Would I you agree I, with that? I think some truth okay. to that, yes. Okay. You mentioned about country being uh, there among your three basic values. In what ways do you uh, exemplify that commitment. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in a generation that didn't serve in the military and, and um, 
and I kind of wish I did, and I kind of believe in national service of some sort. Uh, the, I do I do participate a little bit in the political world. Not really, when I see most of these people, I tell them, this is as a citizen, it's not as the chairman of Bank One. Uh, I do serve in a thing called Business Executives for National mm -hmm. Security, uh, and I try to participate in those ways. Um, and in the business, on 9-11, we did a bunch of things, we being the whole company. Uh, for example, we told all of our reservists that we will pay them the difference between their salary and what the government pays them for the full tour of duty. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's a big deal. That's right. It's a lot mm -hmm. of people who are, and you know why? And I tell people, because people say, Jimmy, you're so tough on money, but you just, no one's doing that. I said, yeah, but they're fighting for us. Right. That's what companies are for. And uh, we sent a lot of firemen to New York. We gave a lot of money, mm -hmm. uh, uh, both personally, the company, and then we matched what other, uh, all our people gave. So we try to do everything like that in any way possible. And, uh, and we do other things. Too. Okay. okay. And we all know that the heart of any company is the people that run operations. So how does Bank One use, find, develop, and retain the best employees for the job? Yeah. Um, and there, I just want to mention one other thing because it's very important to me. The most important thing for, the most important thing I can do for this country right now is have a vibrant, healthy company. That's right. And so, you know, if I take my off of that ball, like if I don't have a vibrant, healthy company, I don't care how many committees I sat on, I didn't help us very much, or the citizens of this, or the communities. That is the most important thing. It's even the most important thing I can do for employees. That's what provides opportunity. So I really try to keep my eye on that ball. And, um, and your question was, how do we retain the best people? Yes. I recruit them recruit yeah. and retain them. You know, recruiting, uh, first of all, I think senior people should recruit. I don't think it should be delegated to a department. Okay. okay, and so, and I'm really firm about that. I think you should recruit not so many people that you bring in so many, you don't have to do with them. So all of our senior people meet all of our MBA recruits, by the way, mm -hmm. and we circulate them around. I know a lot of them. I go to sessions with them all the time. I think we should train them. Mm -hmm. I think that we should spend a lot of time, w and w the things like you asked today, like what are the biggest mistakes you made? What are the, why are we here? How do you deal with this kind of problem? Uh, it's not incentives. I think you have incentives right, because people want to say I'm paid fairly. But, it, but I think what people really want Motivation. is that you're treated as an individual, you're treated fairly, that every time you go to a meeting, you can say whatever you want. You're not, you're not Jeremy, the assistant. You could be the check processing, the clerk, the receptionist, the VP, or the senior VP. If you got something to say that makes a better company, you should feel free to say it. Yes. So we're letting you give to the company to your God-given ability. I think that uh, that will make you say this is a good place. And mm -hmm. you have trust and faith in it. Mm -hmm. If you see me make a lot of bad decisions about people, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to want to leave. Because you can say, hey, he doesn't promote the good ones, he promotes his friends. So you think Bank One has an open door policy? I, I believe we do, but if you ask me honestly, is it throughout the whole company? Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Okay. You know, and we're trying to get there, and some people don't understand it, some are afraid of it. Uh, and we do a lot of things at the top that make it, but it's got to be really pushed deeply down. And okay. it's okay. So I go to these town hall meetings, and people, you know, I always say, you can't insult me. They ask really obnoxious questions, I take them fine and answer them fine. If it teaches all the other management people in the room, it's okay. You don't have to be defensive about it. Just, just hey, if they're right, we're going to fix it. If they're wrong, we're going to explain it to them. And uh, so you try to have a real open door. And you do have a real policy, by the way. Jobs are posted. Yeah. HR has to do certain things to make sure we're being fair to the people. So if I found out that you, would po that you wanted a job and they told you you couldn't have it, mm -hmm. I'd suddenly get a phone call from me. Yeah. I don't mind telling you you're not qualified for it, and here's why, and here we need to be qualified. But they can't tell you, you, you know, you're not... You can't do that job. Okay. 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 Sarah? A lot of what you just said probably kind of answers part of this question too, but how do you keep your employees focused on the mission and the vision of Bank One Corporation, keep them motivated towards that? You know, a lot of the folks know exactly what to do, and mm -hmm. sometimes like when I go to the branches, well, they say, just get the bureaucracy out of my way and I'll be okay. And so my job is you know, just to kill the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've done something wrong, we've confused them, and. Uh, but most of the people, it's an amazing thing inside a company, they actually know what the goals are. They know what the company's trying to do. And it's not whether I put it down in a mission statement. It's whether we mean it by all of our actions. Do we walk the talk? And so, and it's relentless. You gotta do it all the time. All the time. Everyone you touch, every meeting. And then, you know, remember, every time you do something, it affects 10 or 100 or 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. So people start to actually believe it. Mm -hmm. Great. Miguel, you have a, a question for us? Yeah, how do you value diversity in your company? How, how do you leverage over diversity in Bank One? Yeah. I think, um, is that important? It, yeah, for, first of all, diversity is critical, but I'm, let me answer in two ways. One is, one is the most important thing I can do for diversity is have all these other environments I talked about. Open, 
try to see people, share ideas, let you, you know, you're, you're not a slave to your boss, so that everyone feels that they have opportunity, they can talk to anyone, doors are open, so that's number one. The second is, it's gotta be important. I think it's important for several reasons. First, you can feel the best team. I mean, if, you're, if someone's picking a team from white men and I'm picking a team from everybody, I'll have the better team. Right. Second is, I think it's the right thing to do, and third is, I thought it was the law uh, of sorts, and then, uh, and then you try to foster it by going out of your way. It's not enough to say it, you have to do it, okay? Doing it is to make sure that people are connected inside the company, and it's not just informal. You know, if it's just informal, well, you know, the white men end up with the best connections. So you gotta go out of your way to bring, make, pe make sure people are brought in, and they're trained in stuff they don't know. We go to, I go to a lot of, go to Howard University, you know, it's a historical black college and some other place, and we recruit there. We've got a great relationship there. We've got now a pipeline of people, and we're gonna be paying attention to those people if we get them. And I think it's true for all diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a little extra work. Then a CEO of a company should be really close to the people. They have to be. Have to be. I think the CEO's gotta know the people and get close to them, and you know, I should be able to walk, I mean, you know, obviously we all have our fantasies sometimes, but I, I go to bars all the time with people. I want to walk in and a lot of them say, hey, Jamie, how you doing? I mean, right. some I don't remember who they are, but I've been in a town hall meeting, I've been here, I've had them in my office. You have to be close to the people. You will fail if you're not. Now, you could be like a chairman strategist, but then someone else better be running the company day to day. Right. And that people has got to be close to the people. Thank you. Okay. So do you feel that being close to the people is the most important important thing about being the CEO of the company? Bank one. You know, it, it is, you know, the way I look at it a little bit is you have to do the right thing in four or five different things to a minimum. They're like a door. You better get through each door. If you fail any one, I can really mess up the company. If I fail the financial disciplines, understand the profits, analytics, I can fail. If my strategy is so flawed, <laughs> I can fail. If I have no relation with the people, I know it's really going to feel like I can fail. So I think each one of those, so it's not, it's not one or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, you know, we're not all, you know, most of us, we have, I have a lot of help. I got a lot of really, really smart people doing a lot of stuff they know, which they know far better than me. And that's a, my job knows is just to get them in the room. People sometimes say, Jamie, your job is to, but you get to pay the big bucks to make the decision. I say, no, I don't. I get paid the big bucks to make sure the right decision is made. I don't know how to make it sometimes. I need you or you or you come in and say, this is how it should work. We need these people to work together. And you got to, so I'm just, a, I'm just greasing the wheels in some of those conversations. Then, then Lynn, on that point, how hard is meeting is meet the expectations of shareholders in the current economy, based on the points that you already had discussed? You know, uh, you know, when we set standards for ourselves, it's not just me again; it's the, the management team. We talk about it, right. and they know when I'm going to go to Wall Street, what I'm going to say, and we all kind of have try to have the attitude: we believe this, or we wouldn't be saying it. We are striving to that. Then when I go to the shareholders, I'll tell them, we're striving to this, here's what can go wrong, here's what can go well, here's what we're doing well, here's what we gotta fix. So we're very honest about it, and so, you know, part of Wall Street is setting expectations, being honest, and, uh, um, you know, but don't tell them you can accomplish stuff that you can't. And then you do feel this ridiculous pressure to, to constantly be catching up to that carrot that, right. you know, and that's why I think people felt that pressure, did a lot of bad stuff. Thank you. Jeremy, you have a I question? Say, with that, it come, ethics, come, ethics come into play with that. And um, how do you instill ethics among your employees? You know, uh, the best way you instill ethics is that people know they see it in everything you do every day, okay? Every decision, every issue, every policy, every question you answer to employees. Do you answer it honest? They know when you're BSing them. So everything, that's how you, so they know you mean it. It's in your code of conduct, it's in English, it's in accounts payable, it's in, you know, and so they, and they'll hear me. They'll, they'll ask me questions about, Jamie, what about this? I tell them, do I have, uh, does, does the company do this for me? I sell them, no. Does the company do that? I say, yeah, they do do that for me. Are they, so we're very straight and honest about it, and, and I think you earn that over time. They believe it, they want it. You know, ethics, remember, remember we're all gonna make mistakes. So there's, it's, to me, it's the consciousness of making sure people understand you mean it. And they, you know, they do watch, if you work there, you watch the CEO pretty closely to see, like, you know, he always talks about meritocracy, but is he going to fix that problem he's got over there? Or do we just have to fix ours and he doesn't have to fix his? Okay. You know, and I, I know you're saying that behind my back. And yeah, I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so. What's the, the best way for individuals as they prepare to be in the business world to approach learning about the ethical dilemmas that they're going to inevitably face. Yeah. That, that's a hard one, and I think, 
you know, I think I know business schools all now teach classes and they make clear mm -hmm. ethical choices. So I think that's to me that's probably the most important was that people make it part of the regular thing that people know they have a choice. Mm -hmm. It's their choice. Right. There's always a choice. And and there are little code words when people say it, I always make me nervous. Don't worry, everyone does it. Every alarm bell in your head should go off. You know, because because people ask those questions and and uh, it's not true. So mm -hmm. I think it's hard to teach. I, my, I honestly, I think that some of these people are crooks. I think they were crooks deep down to the bone the day they were born. <laughs> I think others don't quite understand the difference between right and wrong a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is the best part of your job? What do you personally enjoy the most about it? I love it when I mean I love traveling around and seeing the people and going to the thing. I love see. I go love love going to schools and. Um, uh, and that's probably the most, you know. I love, I love town hall meetings. I love, I love do, do doing the stuff which I get a kick out of. And I don't like all day long meetings, which I have to do sometimes. <laughs> so I get too, it's, you know, answer when I do that. Yeah. To become a CEO, how do you, ha what do you have to do? I mean, in your life, in your work, everywhere. Yeah, I, first of all, don't set your sights so far ahead that you get disappointed early on. Set your sights one year, two years, five years. Because that's a clear, observable thing. If you do that, you'll get to where you're going. And uh, uh, enjoy your job and work real hard and make sure you've got great relationships with people. And then you get to where you're going. And be prepared for setbacks. You will have setbacks. And how you deal with those are almost more important than how you deal with the good times. But don't get arrogant when you're doing well. I've heard you comment about uh, the philosophy that you would have as a young person taking that first job out of school. Uh, would you uh, share that with us today? Yeah. I think, that, yeah, the first job, you, one of the things you get to pick in life is your partner. So the first job, you know, people worry about whether they make an extra $2,000 or not. Forget that. It'll never matter. What does matter is do you enjoy your job? Do you trust the people you're working with? If you trust them, they're going to be right. making sure. They're going to be they're gonna be telling you to do something wrong. And they're going to be saying, hey, i got a great challenge for you. I want you to do this. They're going to be looking out for you a little bit and pushing you hard and you know, kind of slapping you in the head when you do something wrong. So. Pick your partner, pick the first job where the, you, you, you can love the people and you love the business and stuff like that. Okay, who has the final question today? I ask. Okay. So you become CEO now. What is next? How are you going to keep yourself motivated to keep rising? No, I, I guess I'm going to take my own advice. I look forward to the next five years. I now, I want us to be proud of the place. We've got the infrastructure in place. We've got a called 101st Airborne who can execute stuff. And I like to take us from an okay company to a good, to a great company and build it and you know, maybe I'm not going to look much beyond five to ten years and then hand it up to somebody else. And, uh, and then I'll look for another challenge in life. And there are always others. And, you know, maybe I'll want to stay after that, but I'm not sure. So, Some have suggested that uh, sometimes people stay in their leadership positions too long yeah. for the good of the organization. Different kinds of leaders are needed at different points in an uh, organization's life. Do you share that vision? I do. I think there are, first of all, I don't, I don't think it's because of your age and I don't think it's right. automatic. Right. But I do believe that sometimes it's time to move on. So, you know, even if, you know, even if I got to the point, even if people thought I was doing a great job, and but I still, you know, I'm, it's 10 years from now, I'm 56, I can do it for at least another five or six years. Mm -hmm. But I had this guy here, or you, or you doing it, and I, we didn't want to lose you, and you're going to be doing it for the next 15 or 20 years. I think I should go just to give you the shot because it's better for the company. Right. You know, and so why save my last two years and then lose Sarah, who's going to be, you know, the next, you know, Jack Welch of all time. So. I think it's different for different people in different businesses. It's not age-related as much as it is there's a natural time. Unfortunately, our time has expired. I thank you, panelists, for your questions, and a special thanks to you, Mr. Diamond, for joining us in this Meet the Leaders program. This program was produced by the Walton College of Business and directed by Jim Goodlander. So from the Walton College of Business, we thank you for watching.